everybody. It's Chris Duker for geeknernet.com. And let me tell you, uh, we're still in the pandemic, as you all know, but I am so excited to be joined by Teddy Wilson. Teddy Wilson is the host of an amazing show called Mighty Trains. If you have not seen it, you should watch it because trains are freaking awesome. And uh, season four of Mighty Trains de uh, debuts on Discovery Canada at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific, uh, Thursday, October 21st. Teddy Wilson, hello. Chris, good to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm great, man. It's uh, it's great to see you. And I don't even care that it's on Zoom. Uh, because, <laughs> but, dude, uh, you know, so great to see you again. I just called you dude. So, hey, that's a good way to set it off. I love um, it. I love it. <laughs> Listen, I, I know uh, Geek Nerd Net, as you know, uh, amazing friend of my site for years and just a great guy, like I said. Uh, oh, Geek Nerd Net is... Oh, you're welcome. Geeknerdnet.com is all about kind of indie comics and stuff. But you know what? Every once in a while, I like to stretch out and go to what people are geeky about. And you, my friend, are geeky about trains. Uh, talk about your start on Mighty Trains, how the show kind of came about, and then uh, and, and to now. Well, you know, I started shooting Mighty Trains. I did the first two seasons while I was also doing a show called Inner Space at the Space Channel in Canada. And that's how you and I met. Um, you know, we had some great times together at several uh, Calgary comic uh, and entertainment expos. It was still one of my favorite conventions I've ever been to. We always loved going there. And, you know, on that show on Inner Space, we talked a lot about what you talk about with your, with your site and your work, um, you know, comic books, sci-fi, horror, um, and all, all, all things geek. And that was really a dream job for me. But then in my last few years at Interspace, I kind of got this other dream job that I was really just so stupid, stupid lucky that I got to do both at once. So, you know, I would, I would shoot Interspace um, a lot of the year and they actually let me go and to go shoot uh, Mighty Trains. So each episode takes one to two weeks to film and they let me go do that for two seasons while I was working at Interspace. So I kind of I had a lot of pinch me moments in my career working on Interspace, just interviewing some of the, um, you know, the creators and the, the people that we love, actors, writers, directors, comic book creators. And so I, I thought at that point, oh, I've got the dream job. But then, as I say, I got the second one because I also really love to travel. And so we shot those first two seasons in some mighty trains while I was doing Interspace. And then Interspace ended. We had a, we had a great 10 year uh, run, um, but like all things that must come to an end. And so it ended after 10 great seasons. And then I've continued to uh, to do Mighty Trains. So I'm, I consider myself very lucky. It, I really do feel like I have the best job in the world. On the show, we go all over the world highlighting the most incredible rail journeys on earth, um, the amazing landscapes, the mind-blowing engineering and technology that goes into them, the scenery, and then also the people who work on the train and for the railroads and make these journeys possible. And then some of the people who go as passengers and take them. So we kind of give you a 360 view of some of the most amazing rail journeys on earth. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy with, with season four. I, I think it's our best season yet. And uh, we go all over the world once again. So yeah, I mean, the, the Coles notes are, uh, or the too long didn't read note would be, I'm a lucky, lucky dude. <laughs> You know what? I love that. I it's uh, it's very cool. Like you said, it's cool to be and not only just have one dream job that lasts a decade, uh, uh, and to have the other job come in, the other dream job come in. Like you said, congratulations on the success of it. I mean, it's thank uh, you. What, you know, I know myself and uh, not just you, but fans of the show Mighty Trains are like clamoring at the bit to to watch a new season, and uh, this is going to be cool, man. So. Huh? Um, where can you can you give us some insight on uh, places you went to for season four? Yeah, well, we, we shot it right before the world turned upside down with the global pandemic. We got back from our last shoot in New Zealand, I think a day or two before the first lockdown here in Ontario. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Um, and uh, before that, we shot uh, our, all of our six episodes. So we did get it right in under the wire. We were very fortunate in that regard. Um, but the season kicks off with an amazing train in Peru that goes high up into the Andes Mountains, uh, about 5,000 meters above sea level. That's half the height to the tip of Everest. And uh, it's a train that goes up there. It's the second highest train on earth. I got altitude sickness on the trip. It was really wild. I'd never been to that country before and, and really fell in love with it. And from there, the season just stays really strong. We go to Japan or on the island of Kyushu on one of the most luxurious trains in the world called the Seven Stars. 
We go back to New Zealand where we were in our second season of the show. And this time we cover a train called the Coastal Pacific that goes up the Pacific um, coast of the South Island of New Zealand. And this was a train that when we were there about four or five years ago wasn't operational because it had been wiped out by the 2016 massive Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand. So this is a train that they've rebuilt. They've rebuilt the lines and it's a real testament to the resilience and the ingenuity of the, the people of New Zealand that it's running again. And then we also go to um, uh, Serbia and Montenegro for the first time ever on the show. We take a train that touches three different countries in one journey. So it's uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Montenegro. And it's a really amazing train. And it was my first part time in the Balkans in that part of the world and, and really loved it. And then, and then we also go to, um, uh, to Vietnam. It's my first time in that country. And uh, we do a train that goes all the way from the North Hanoi down to the south to Ho Chi Minh City or, or Saigon. And it's, it's called the Reunification Express. And it's kind of a symbol of um, post-Vietnam War uh, Vietnamese reunification. So it's, it's an amazing train. And then also we go back to Spain where we were in a previous season, but this time we take an eight day journey over a thousand kilometers along the rugged Northern coast of the country on a really, really beautiful kind of old timey ornate train that's, uh, that's just excellent. So yeah, that's the season in a nutshell. And uh, I think it's our strongest yet. So I'm really happy for people to see it. Oh, that's very cool. I mean, I, you, on the tail end there, you mentioned Spain. Uh, I remember, I can, uh, forgive me, you'll tell me which season it was, but uh, when you were at Spain before, the, yeah. it was, I think, uh, were you on one of the fastest trains there? Was Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, your brain working? No, your pandemic brain's spot on. Your memory's yeah. great. Yeah, we, we did a train in season two that is a high-speed train, a bullet train, one of the fastest I think it actually was the fastest in Europe at the time, uh, connecting Madrid to Barcelona. So that was a very different sort of train in Spain. This is one that really takes its time and is all about the journey. It's it's a luxury train as well, and it's uh, it's beautiful. But that rugged northern coast of Spain is really something to see. Very cool. I mean, I wanna um, I wanna talk about uh, a bit about home. I mean, I, you know, I I'm in Calgary. Uh, we're yeah. both Canadian, and uh, you, you did the Rocky Mountaineer uh, a while back. That that's yeah. I mean, like for luxury, I I haven't done it yet. I mean, I would love to do it one day. Yeah, gorgeous train. Talk just talk a bit about that experience. Oh, I, I love the Rocky Mountaineer. And that's a real Canadian success story. Um, you know, it's a it's a homegrown company that's done really well. They recently actually launched a line down in uh, in Utah into, I believe, Colorado, the uh, the Moab line, it's called. Um, so they're expanding and they're doing they're doing really well. But we took both of the um, the train routes that the Rocky Mountaineer takes out west through the Rockies. And it was, it, it's really something, it's incredible. As you say, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a backpackers or a budget trip. There's a, uh, a price tag associated with it as there are with a lot of these luxury trains. But, you know, when we wrote it, we made, met a lot of people and families who had saved up, you know, over, over time to take it and were really kind of treating themselves. And uh, it's a beautiful, very luxurious train. And it's just, you know, the vantage point that you get going through the Rocky Mountains, through these beautiful giant uh, curved dome cars with these dome windows that they have is, uh, is incredible. Yeah. So if you're ever in a, in a position to be able to, um, to take that train, I'd, I'd highly recommend it because I mean, there's nothing more beautiful than the Rockies. Nice. I, I have to agree hundred uh, yeah. <laughs> percent. The, the one thing I love about the, the one thing I love about the show uh, is every once in a while, I mean, it's great to see the inner workings of trains. It's great to see in a sense behind the walls, you don't see that make everything hum. Right. Uh, mm. That's just really cool. But what I love too is, um, not just the connection aspect of people who are riding these trains, but actually the towns, and no matter what country you're in, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the towns and the people really celebrate, uh, you know, uh, that connectivity. It really is like, it brings, it literally brings people together. And um, I yeah. love that, um, that lens you guys put, that the show puts on, puts on uh, the, these town folks around the world. Like, was there something, any particular towns that maybe stand out for you or, or is it sort of all a mesh of like, feel good? No, I mean, I, I really remember the details of every trip because I really do love my job. So I really try to take it in and remember moments. And you're right. I mean, I think trains, you know, really do connect people and communities. Back in season one, the first episode we ever shot was the Canadian. So that's a via rail train up in Canada. And it goes from Vancouver all the way to Toronto. You can also take it to Toronto to Vancouver, but we started out west and went to Toronto. And that was my first time traversing my own country by land. And obviously Canada is the second biggest country in the world. It's massive. So to get from Vancouver to Toronto, which is only about two thirds of the way across the country, it takes 
like uh, four days, four nights, basically. Um, and you're, you're going the whole time. And I found that really fascinating, seeing my own country, seeing the changing landscape and topography. And to your point about it, trains connecting communities, you know, that's a train where you're going through the prairies, say, and you see a, a grain elevator and, and these towns that were built along the rail line. It's because the railway came through that these towns were, were built. And you'll see the grain elevators right there. And it's that way along the whole, um, the whole length of the, of the journey. You know, you'll see these towns that popped up because of the railway. And that was the first episode we ever shot. And I've now seen that same phenomenon all over the world. Um, you know, these, these communities uh, that are, are at one point remote become less remote and more accessible and thus build up more and more because the trains go through. And, you know, on trains like the Canadian and on other trains that we travel, that we've covered around the world, sometimes, you know, there are scheduled stops, but then sometimes the trains will stop for people and just pick them up there. They're not hitchhikers because they're going to, they're going to pay <laughs> to go on, but they're in such remote communities that there's not a scheduled stop. So if the train knows that somebody's going to be out there, they'll just stop to pick up one person. It's uh, it's really fascinating, and uh, yeah, as I say, we've seen that all over the world, and it's amazing how trains connect people and and communities. It's quite something. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, from a uh, from a road trip point of view, um, years ago, my wife and I were driving with a friend through uh, from Alberta to British Columbia, and I, th I believe it was. Craig Lashy. Is it Craig Lashy? Where the last spike is. Uh, yeah. the, the last spike of the uh, railway for Canada. And yeah. um, it's this, it's at the time, this is years ago now, but at the time it was so very Canadian and humble. It's just a tiny little sign that says last spike. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like we drew up by it. We're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Did we miss yeah. that? You know, this is all humble, like humble brag. Like, oh yeah, so the last spike sort of here. <laughs> I want to go see it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I, from, from, from minor fun, funny little things like that, and I'm sure you've seen tons of them. I, I have to ask you, uh, do you have a, uh, I got a few questions here for you on, on the trains and that, that you've been on through the world scariest ride like one where you're just like oh. hanging on going oh dear god well you know the one uh our season premiere is in peru as i said this train that goes almost five kilometers high into the andes mountains and i wasn't scared on it though there are some pretty jaw jaw dropping kind of views and drops but i did get altitude sickness this is the train where they have a nurse on every car because so many passengers get altitude sickness and i wasn't sure if i would but i did so you got to get administered oxygen and it's it's pretty wild so i always knew i was safe i wasn't scared but that was my first time having you know pretty acute altitude sickness for, for a little right. while you really do feel awful um for a yeah. for a spell so that that was really interesting back in our second season we did an amazing train also in south america in ecuador called the trend crucero that has these amazing drops you know you're looking at the side of the window down the side of a giant mountain um so those would be two that uh that really really stand out for me um, nice at, yeah, but I've, I've always felt safe when we're doing the show, but there are moments where you're like, I, I can't believe that trains go to these places and you're treated <laughs> with this, these jaw-dropping views. It's amazing. For sure. Uh, you just reminded me, I mean, was it Ecuador or was it, for some reason I have Chile in my head again, this was last summer when I watched the episode um, and I'm, I'm going to explain it really poorly. So please help me out. Uh, there was, a tra it was South America. There's a train that you, you, you had to, to switch tracks, you had to go up, and then they had to back, uh, like reverse the train down this mountain. Am I? Yeah, you Ecuador. Know what I'm talking about Ecuador. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. It was that one. It was that yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That that goes up a mountain mountain called the Devil's Nose, and the only yes. way to get up it is to kind of do they're called switchbacks, so to go forward and then reverse and forward and then reverse, and that's yeah. the way to get up because you got to have elevation, but you don't have the surface area to achieve that elevation. Another way that trains do that, including the Rocky Mountaineer, uh, we've seen this uh, technology at play in Switzerland as well on a few trains they do um they do spiral tunnels or like corkscrew tunnels they they call them as well so basically it goes around inside a mountain so it's a way to achieve elevation but to stay in on a certain uh surface area or footprint so that technology is really really fascinating as well and you see right. that on, on on a bunch of trains around the world very cool yeah thanks for pointing out the, the devil's nose though the devil's nose. It's yeah, Ecuador, like, yeah, beautiful just country. The name, right? So, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I want a, a couple more for you. Uh, the the most fun train, I guess, you've been on to date, and then one you you definitely have to do again. You're like, oh, I got to get back there. 
Well, I, I would really love to go back to India. In our second season, we went to India and we rode a train called the Maharaja's Express. It's a luxury train, uh, but just being in India um, is something I'd really like to do again. I'd really like to go back there and um, and take trains around the country on, on different lines. Um, you know, the Maharaja's Express is a beautiful luxury train. In my personal life, I'm kind of more of a, a backpacker and a budget traveler. So um, I'd probably take different sorts of trains in India, but I would really love to go and do India by train. So that's somewhere that I would love to go back to. Japan, I'm really fortunate that we've shot uh, two episodes there now. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. I'd love to go back. Uh, in our third season, we went to South Africa. It was my first time on the African continent at all, actually. And uh, South Africa is a beautiful country with, with wonderful people. And we got to basically cross the whole country. So I can't wait to go back on that trip, a beautiful train called Robus Rail. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the list goes on. I really, I, I'm really easy to please as a traveler. I just love <laughs> yeah. going and seeing new places and meeting new people and experiencing new cultures. So there really is, isn't anywhere that we've been on Mighty Trains that I wouldn't be really enthusiastic to go back to. And in terms of uh, fun on the train, this this train that we do in Spain was a lot of fun because you're on it for, we were on it for eight days. So you oh, get to know a lot of the other passengers, a lot of the yeah. other staff, they had a few parties on board. <laughs> so that that would be near the top of my list. Um, it's called the Trans Cantabrico Classico and it would be yeah. near the top of my list in terms of fun, fun trains. Nice, very nice. Um, okay, so you're right. Okay, so let's say you're riding a nondescript train but you're riding a train. Uh, it's, uh, I have to ask you this question and I'm gonna kind of turn it this way a bit, but um, you're on a train, you're having fun. You're like, this is great. Look at those views, look at that drop. Uh, uh, give me that oxygen, all that kind of stuff. You're like, huh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sit down and read some comics. Um, oh. what, are some, what, are some, what are some good stand, old standbys, new standby? What, what are some you love, um, you know, that you've, whether recently or before, you know what, this, this is the sit down for a while train of reading for me. I, I I would often bring uh, comics and graphic novels on on our trips, you know, for the long plane rides and stuff. I always do a lot of research for for our shows. I get mm -hmm. kind of a research pack from our from our excellent production team, and so I I really do take a lot of pride in like learning a lot about the trains. So I'm not just saying pre-rehearsed lines and that I can kind right. of do things off the cuff to camera based on some knowledge that I've acquired by reading this great research. So a mm -hmm. lot of my playing time is spent. Um, learning more and more about the trains. But then when I'm done that, I often have, a, I have graphic novels on hand. In terms of my, uh, my classic go-tos, you know, um, like a lot of people, you know, consider kind of the Holy Trinity, uh, Watchmen, Dark Knight yeah. Returns, and Mouse by Art Spiegelman. Huh. Uh, yep. A lot of people consider those kind of the holy holy trinity of especially kind of um, late 80s comics. And I, I would agree with that. Mouse is one of my favorite graphic novels of all time. If you've never read it, please do. It's about the Holocaust and the Second World War. I believe it won the Pulitzer Prize as well. But it's a mm -hmm. very impactful, moving graphic novel. And it'll complete, if you're not already a fan of graphic novels, or maybe if you think of comics as just about being superheroes, which is great. But if you kind of think that's what comics are limited to as an mm -hmm. art form, I highly recommend checking out Mouse because it'll open your mind to what comics as a medium can achieve um, totally. and, can, and can kind of make you make you feel. Um, so those those would be up there for me. I, I do like a lot of Batman comics. Killing Joke is also great. The Alan Moore one, Batman Year One by Frank Miller is one of my favorite comics of all time. Uh, yeah on the Superman side. So sticking with superheroes, yeah. uh, Superman Red Sun, which is the kind oh. of alternate history of Superman. If he had landed in the Soviet yeah. Union, uh, instead of in, in America and in Kansas. Uh, that's that's my favorite one-off Superman comic of all time. That's, uh, absolutely my top, love that's a top it. shelf for me too. Sorry, I didn't uh, interrupt yeah, 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 No, 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 not shelf. at all. Oh, I love it. I love alternate history stuff. So yeah. that's my favorite. I also really like, uh, I think it's called Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. It's a very thin one-off graphic novel by Alan Moore. Um, yeah. I like that one a lot. Uh, and I've liked some of the other runs on, on Superman. And then uh, kind of on the non-superhero side, I really love the work of Jeff Lemire, who's a wonderful, wonderful um, comic book writer and illustrator. He's Canadian. Uh, the one that kind of um, broke him into the mainstream was called Essex County. It won a lot of awards. But since then, he, he did a run on Animal Man, the New 52 run, which I recently reread, which was great. Um, but then he's also done Underwater Welder, uh, Black Hammer. Um, he's, he's really, really amazing. Um, he recently did a collaboration with Gord Downey too, 
um, on a really, really impactful, moving in, uh, comic about um, some First Nations issues in, in Canada. That was a yep. wonderful, wonderful read, uh, very moving. And Secret uh, so uh, he's Secret fantastic. Path, right? yeah. Secret Path, yeah, that's yeah. right. It, and it's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing, very impactful read. And then of course he did Sweet Tooth, which is a Netflix yeah. show now. Um, and totally. he, he created the comic for that. So I love that. I also, um, uh, Brian K. Vaughn, I really like. I read all, all of Why the Last Man. Um, which I really like. He also did one of my other favorite one-off comics of all time called Pride of Baghdad, which actually a lot of people I meet haven't read it, but it's a one-off comic about I a, a zoo in Baghdad. Oh, it's during the first Iraq war. It's about a zoo in Baghdad that gets bombed and it follows this pride of lions around. Um, it's one of the few times I've cried, you know, reading a, reading a comic. It's very, very moving. So Pride of Baghdad I'd put up there. And yeah, I like, I, I like all sorts of stuff as you can, as you can yeah. tell. I, I went back um, and discovered a lot of Will Eisner when I started working at Space Channel. He was mm -hmm. one of our producers, Mark Asquith, who I call the king of Canadian comics. <laughs> he, uh, he, he taught me a lot about the medium and he recommended going back and reading the early Will Eisner stuff. So Contract with God, which um, it's a trilogy and a lot of people consider it the first graphic novel, not the first comic book, but really the first time the medium was kind of elevated and tackled these more weighty issues. A lot of people consider it the first graphic novel ever and uh, it's excellent as well. And uh, Dropsy Avenue, he writes a lot about his, his life growing up kind of semi-fictionalized uh, in Brooklyn, in New York. So any Will Eisner you can go back and read is uh, is awesome. So anyway, the list the list goes on and on. I feel like I could talk about comics forever, <laughs> but you know, and I wasn't as into them as a kid. I read the odd superhero comic, but it was really um, as an adult that I became really enamored uh, with the medium. Nice. Uh, I mean, there's a lot there. I, I... Oh, and Saga, sorry, but the new one, oh, Saga, yeah. I'm not quite up to date, but Saga, if you guys haven't read it, is one of the yeah. best modern comics out there. It's an amazing run so far, and it just stays good. I, I couldn't sorry. agree more. And I, no, <laughs> no, I couldn't agree more. And I agree on your, at, at, the, at the beginning there, you're talking about the, the, the trinity of graphic novels. Uh, yeah. You and I talked about Mouse. Uh, oh god like three four oh god maybe four years ago now i don't know what time is but yeah. it was at one of the expos where we we're chatting about it and uh, i said i'm gonna read that and i haven't read it yet but it is on my list and now oh. pride of baghdad is on my list because that sounds yeah. well, that sounds amazing it's uh, incredible it it's just back. it's just a one-off you know but it, it's excellent and yeah mouse will uh will also move you to tears yeah Fantastic. Well, uh, you know what? There's there's comics that we're going to train, but there's also shows to watch on TV. And again, excited for season four of Mighty Trains, uh, Discovery Canada, Thursday, October 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Teddy Wilson is your host. And Teddy Wilson is just a great guy. So, Teddy, thanks for being here, man. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks for all the support over the years. You were always great to, um, to us, us inner space folks when we came out to, uh, to Alberta. You were always so supportive and so great. And yeah, it's, it's great to connect with you again, man. Great. Thanks, Teddy. Cheers, man. Bye.